and welcome to Things We Said Today, our weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles as group, as solo artist, past, present, future, if we can figure out what that's going to be. I'm Alan Cozen, the author of The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop and Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything. And I'm joined by my two regular co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you know as the host of the syndicated radio show, Every Little Thing. Hello, Ken. Hi, Alan. Hi, everybody. And Steve Marinucci, uh, who writes about Beatles news for Axis.com, Billboard.com, Variety, um, gold mine, all kinds of places, all kinds of new places being added almost weekly. Hello, Steve. <laughs> Hello, Alan. Hello, everyone. Okay. And today we have a special guest, uh, Walter Everett, the author of a stack of books about the Beatles and related subjects. And we will introduce him directly in a couple of minutes. But first, we have some news. And Steve... I'll hand that over to you. Okay. Um, well, this past week, uh, the concert for George uh, uh, came back in the theaters for a day, and it also, well, they had the big re-release for George's birthday. A visitor to my Facebook page was marveling about the sound. I did not see it myself, but he said that the uh, the new sound was uh, uh, much better than, than previous. There was also a, a new George Harrison comic book, released by Tidal Wave Comic Books. Um, it's a, one of those bio comic books, and it's on. It's available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and everywhere else you can get it. It's I, put I, out again. I think Go they ahead. prefer to call them graphic novels now. Graphic novels. I guess it's novels. not really a well, novel, okay. graphic bio. <laughs> well, it says, I'm looking at the website, and it says bio comic book, so that's, huh? what, that's what it said. That's what they're they're calling it, but yeah, I think a, gra- a graphic novel is probably a better terminology for it. The Ruddles announced a UK tour. Uh, we you all heard Neil here, Neil Innes here last week uh, in a very marvelous marvelous interview, and uh, they announced a UK tour. They're also touring the US, but this is a little more extensive uh, in the UK. And then um, did I mention the Weakling single? The the Weaklings put out a new single called In the Moment, which is song, a song they've been performing. They don't have an album coming out uh, yet. They will eventually. Um, but uh, um, but the new single is out digitally. It comes out on March 2nd uh, digitally. And it's, it is on YouTube, uh, In the Moment, the video for that. Mm-hmm. So, Could I add something? Sure. <laughs> oh, I wanted to add something about the concert for George, because, Steve, you said that it's running for one day. And if you actually go to the concert's website, concertforgeorge.com, they have a link there for theatrical listings. And it is true that most of the theaters are running it for a day, but they're not all running it on George's birthday. There are some that are actually running it in March, so you might want to check that out. Mm-hmm. There are a lot of uh, theaters in the United States in particular that are running it in March, and some are running it for more than a day. So Okay. All right, then. And that's it for news. Sort of a slow news week, seemingly. Yeah. Um, which is. You know, this, well, this is Walt, uh, can I ask uh, a question? There was mention in the run up to the show here that a new photograph from George had just uh, appeared. A photograph from him in 1965. Well, I, I don't, I don't know if it's new, Walter, but a friend of mine posted a picture on his. Facebook page um, of this this shot of George, uh, young looking shot of George, and he said it was from '65. And I, and and a couple of us who know him, I he I, he's a former colleague of mine. I told him that I hadn't seen the picture before, and somebody else that worked with he and I said the same thing. And and she was also a Beatle fan, and so I posted it on my facebook page my beatles facebook page and everybody was really amazed that they hadn't seen this picture before how, how long ago did you post it steve i'll have last, to look. last night I oh, oh okay last night. okay yeah it's um, still, it's, still know, there it, it's just great how photographs you've never seen before just come up and you know hearing that reminded me of i think my all-time favorite beetle photograph is of george harrison it's in the book that Olivia put together with Scorsese, you know, mm-hmm. and 
combination mm-hmm. with a Scorsese film. And uh, there's this picture of George in his Beatles suit on the observation deck of the Empire State Building. Mm-hmm. The picture was taken, and he's holding a camera. He's a tourist, right? The picture was taken in his visit to the States. Was it uh, August or September 63 before the Beatles oh, uh, right. Right. arrived? I remember and, that. Yeah, and he's just walking along in the observation deck among all kinds of other people who have no idea who he is. <laughs> and there he is, beetle haircut and the beetle suit. It, it's just a beautiful photograph. So, you know, a, a new photograph of George is a very welcome thing. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Yeah. So there was one just, other thing. Go ahead. <laughs> there was one other thing about George, and that's um, that over the past weekend... Uh, they were playing his music at Starbucks coffee houses. And I know that you posted something about that, Steve, on Facebook. Because the music, from what I understand, was uh, curated by Danny. Hmm. Right. He had his own playlist. So that was a pretty cool thing to do. It's kind of interesting when you think about it. And I've been wondering, the concert for George coming out through through Concord Music, why it wasn't through Universal. And, you know, Paul used to be on Concord Music. And then uh, when he signed they had a special deal going on with Starbucks then. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's kind of interesting that uh, the two of them, it's kind of similar what uh, went on with their releases. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and, and not to drag this on too long, but it was funny that people were saying that, uh, you know, that the the Blu-ray had gone out of print. I mean, I got one. Um, I bought one a year or two ago, and I'm glad I did because... You know, apparently at that point, you know, they hadn't gone out of print yet. So, um, I mean, it's weird that it went out of print to begin with. That was kind of weird. But anyway. Okay, so let me introduce Walter formally, even though you've heard him for a couple of seconds here. He is a uh, professor of music at the University of Michigan School of Music, Theater, and Dance um, since 1989. The books that are particularly relevant to us here are, well, there's two volumes of The Beatles as Musicians. Volume one is The Quarrymen Through Rubber Soul. Volume two is Revolver Through the Anthology. And there's a third book that you should, you know, basically all look at if you care about this stuff. Um, Even though it's not specifically to do with The Beatles, it's called The Foundations of Rock, from Blue Suede Shoes to Sweet Judy Blue Eyes. And they are all published by Oxford University Press. And the Beatles books, the two Beatles books, take a very detailed analytical look at the Beatles music from the point of view of a trained musician who understands how chords function as as opposed to just what they are. And all of the other analytical sort of apparatus that typically, uh, until moderately recently, was really just applied mainly to classical music. And there have been a few attempts to bring that approach to the Beatles, starting, I guess, with Wilfred Mellers back in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, He had a book called Twilight of the Gods. And... I got that when it came out, and my feeling was that, you know, Wilfred Miller's heart was in the right place, and his analytical stuff was in the right place. He just didn't seem to really understand what the Beatles' music was actually about. I don't know. Tim Riley did one, and uh, Terence O'Grady, but Walter's books are by far the most thorough And apart from being the most thorough, I mean, you look at his sources and you look at the stuff he mentions, and I mean, none of the others, I think, would have taken a passing interview in Beatles Monthly magazine and used it as evidence of what might have gone on in the recording of a track. So, you know, you read these books and you know that on one hand, we're talking about, you know, a serious musicologist and analyst, and on the other hand, he's, he's like one of us. (laughs) <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, all the bootlegs are referred to, everything, you know. So, so Walter, well, yeah, <laughs> welcome to the show. Well, thanks, thanks, so, thanks so much for the wonderful uh, 
introduction, your appreciation of the books are, you know, is, is really fine. And uh, thank you uh, to Ken and Alan, too, for having me. Uh, it's really a pleasure talking to you guys. And, and oh, yeah, I am one of you guys. And, uh, you know, I saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan in 1964. And even though I'd had, you know, three years of piano lessons by that time, that was the event that made me decide I was going to be a musician, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so, yeah, I, you know, bought bootlegs uh, as soon as I saw them. Uh, yeah. My eyes came out of my head when I saw that uh, Wilfred Mellers book um, around 1976. And yeah, it's just, it's been a, it's been a great, uh, been a great ride ever since. Mm -hmm. So I guess the logical question is to ask you know why why is it important to analyze and explain the Beatles in terms that you would normally apply to classical music I mean given that they're self-trained musicians don't read music and that everything we're hearing is intuitive in a way I guess um, that's right it is extremely intuitive uh, you know uh, Aeolian cadences are about the mildest sort of relationship I talk about, and, and that's something obviously John Lennon thought were, you know, was a reference to exotic birds. So mm -hmm. you know, it's true that that many musicians, even even those who are highly trained, highly trained composers and performers, may not be aware of what they're doing. Uh, it's all the best music is intuitive. A, a highly trained person may come about things more easily but you know you can't say paul mccartney isn't trained just because he can't read music or doesn't understand the terminology obviously he has size 10 ears and ever since he was listening to his dad play on the family piano he's been soaking it in and everything he hears goes right into his music and yeah i'm sure he couldn't uh he couldn't read uh, one of the denser paragraphs of my books, and uh, <laughs> and and said, "Oh yeah, this is that's exactly what I was thinking." You know, no, that that's not what I'd expect to hear from him. But the kinds of things I draw out are an explanation for why the things work, and not everybody will be interested in that. But you know, I I really wrote those those books were my tenure project. You know, where you have to prove to the people at the top of the field that you've got the chops and <laughs> and you know you're not a poser so I, I really wrote the books for about eight people who'd be writing letters for my tenure file i see but uh you know i've been it's just it's changed my career really to see the reception the books got from the general public, people who don't know how to read music, who maybe play guitar, maybe just like to listen to Beatles music. And, you know, so many emails saying, well, you know, uh, there's so many great insights here. Uh, your appreciation of the, you know, the guitars and what went on in the control room uh, and what inspired the Beatles and your interpretations are neat. I just, I just skip all the parts I don't understand. And, mm -hmm. and so you know, that's what made me try to reach the general public as really the central readership for the Foundations of Rock. Although it, too, is, you know, coming from an academic, you can't mistake, mistake that. I think it's much more readable by the general uh, public than, uh, than uh, some of the more technical things in Beatles books. Mm -hmm. So you, you didn't get a note from Paul McCartney saying, yes, I, I did mean to go to the submediant <laughs> there, you know? <laughs> no, but, but you right. know, there's wonderful, he, he talks about musical relationships in a very subtle way. Uh, he did an interview with T Terry Gross maybe seven or eight years ago, and he, he was talking about when we, you know, Terry asked him, when did you know that you were really doing something original? And McCartney said, you know, when we were writing from me to you and we went into the bridge, he said, the song is in C major and normally you'd have a G major chord, but we use a G minor chord. And it was like going into another world. Mm -hmm. 
And it was. I mean, what happens is we actually go a little bit from C major to F major at that point, which often happens at the beginning of a bridge. Mm -hmm. And his saying it's like going to another world. It's like leaving the home key behind and going to a new key, and which he may not have appreciated, but he certainly understood the effect mm -hmm. that he was at. Yeah. So, in other words, for people who just like listening to the records they get to that bridge and it sounds like not what they expected and it's really ear catching and your job basically is to say why in, in, that's right yeah. and and then the cool thing is uh saying oh they did exactly the same thing i want to hold your hand mm -hmm. you know and to see all the you know career spanning tricks that you, you can't say the Beatles composed by formula because every song is different but there are little tricks that keep coming back mm -hmm. sometimes years apart and then you say oh yeah that's McCartney remembering how he did this in eight days a week or whatever yeah have you ever wondered if they secretly could read music I mean <laughs> because because you know McCartney talks about golden slumbers and you know reading his you know, paging through his um, I guess stepsister's piano book and, right, and, right. He, and he's saying well I was just reading the words and you know just playing melodies to go with the words but I kind of wonder and and also I don't know when I was in London to do interviews for the anthology there was this meeting that George walked into and what did he have in his hand he had a stack of blank manuscript paper and why would he need blank manuscript paper that's if, right well you know uh, George did study music theory actually but for his northern Indian music mm -hmm. uh, I mean he would you, you may have seen the films of him uh, from summer in California. It might have been 67. Uh, and he's working on his sitar and he's saying the syllables. So you could hear him coaching the group uh, for Within You, Without You in the deluxe pepper mm -hmm. set. Has, has any of you heard the um, heard that uh, it's a rehearsal session for Within You, Without You? Mm -hmm. And. George is teaching the parts by ear, but he's singing the syllables gamma pani that you know he learned in Indian. So you know he probably didn't need manuscript paper to do that. But he, the gamma pani is the Indian equivalent to you know writing the note names in uh, in notation. Mm -hmm. And McCartney probably would have been the closest to have use for reading and writing music. Uh, and he he could really have done quite a bit that way with arranging for you know uh, uh, orchestral instruments. Say, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it was during the the Liverpool Oratorio, or was it during the Standing Stone project that he really he says he made an effort at learning to read music, but it just uh, it was too much effort for him. It got in the way of his uh, his normal way of thinking. So he also hmm. had a, a a sort of irrational fear of if he learned music um, formally that he might subconsciously plagiarize or something, which two of his pals have been taken to court for. But the example he uses is um, that Leonard Bernstein somewhere is like the slow movement of the uh, Beethoven, I think, second piano concerto. And, but, like, that's deliberate. That's not a mistake. That's sort of... Oh, neat. An homage. <laughs> no, so. I. That's that's a funny thing. I mean, uh, McCartney is more likely to plagiarize just from having heard something and it's knocking around in his head. I mean, look how he worried for years before deciding that he really had written yesterday. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it, it wasn't anything he ever would have seen. Um, right. And I, I would guess that if you see a score in manuscript you're more likely to remember it as something you've seen and mm -hmm. you would have both the oral and the um, visual connection with it. You'd be more likely to remember that it's not yours. Mm -hmm. yeah. So mm -hmm. I should at this point pass you to Ken. We go around and everyone asks questions. So mm -hmm. Ken. Okay. I just wanted to add to what you just were talking about with Paul and not wanting to learn properly like music theory i think that there's a fear in him 
that if you're taught this is the proper way, these are the chords that go in this key, you know, that he's likely to think he can't stray from that instead of doing what might sound more uh, natural or what he's feeling, you know, in his head or in his right. mind. Right. Which, well, uh, you know, there, there is an anxiety there for sure, but there's also, you know, McCartney wanting to make sure that he's using his own voice as, you know, as widely varied as the styles and, and different ways he has of communicating in music. He wants to have his own voice. So, for instance, in writing yesterday, remember, he wanted to give the cello that E flat. Uh, mm -hmm. And George Martin said, oh, no, no, Bach would never have written that. And, and McCartney says, oh, well, then we've got to do it then. <laughs> and from that point on, when there were references to Bach, whether obscure or direct, you know, the so-called harpsichord solo, the wind-up piano solo and In My Life, or the trumpet, piccolo trumpet in Penny Lane, or Blackbird having been based on McCartney's hearing of a Bach piece. If you listen, all of those Beatles songs have that same flat seventh in it. It's like McCartney's fingerprint. He's like, well, you know, if we're going to say this is Bach, you know, we've missed the point. This is McCartney. And uh, not that he wrote the In My Life solo, but definitely in, in Penny Lane and Blackbird, I hear him go for that bluesy lower seven scale degree, despite the fact that Bach wouldn't have used it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So, he's, you know, he, 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 he doesn't let he, you know, there's an anxiety, I think, about uh, being compared with the classical set. But but he's got, he, you know, he's very strong in his ways to get around that. OK, could you possibly talk about the the odd progressions, chord progressions in Beatles songs? Because and in a way that people who don't really study music can understand this, because I do have a musical background and I do recognize certain things that are unusual in songs. I'm more intrigued by, you know, what preceded the Beatles and what did the Beatles do first or were amongst the first to do? And, uh, you know, were they influenced by the artists around them? But when it comes to chord progressions, I know that in the case of I Want to Hold Your Hand, like the first four chords where it goes is unusual because the last chord where the Beatles are, are singing I think you'll understand it's in the yeah. key of G and That's it goes from a G to a D to an E minor and then to a B major which is very unusual and well, uh, so something like that if you can explain to our listeners why that is different right well the B the B chord in G major is something the Beatles had done in She Loves You. And they had a way of mixing chords that were totally within the scale and those that are totally outside the scale. And at first it would be using, these are chords we call chromatic chords that borrow from pitches outside the major scale. Mm -hmm. uh, and, they, and they're used a lot um, in particular ways. It's just that the Beatles would find new ways to use them, so they would not go to the chords you expect them to. So that uh, the three chord, the median chord, and she loves you, and I want to hold your hand, was part of their 1963 sound. Another chord from she loves you is the the major chord on the second scale degree, which normally is minor. And uh, that when you get a major chord on the second scale degree, it usually goes to the chord built on the fifth scale degree. It's a way of strengthening what we call the five chord uh, built on the fifth scale degree. But instead, the Beatles move in an unexpected way from the major chord on two to a four chord. Mm -hmm. And not only is it a four chord and she loves you, but it's a minor four chord. So it's they go to a C minor chord from an A7 chord, in other words. Very unusual set of relationships. Almost unprecedented, except the fact that they stole it from a Bobby Rydell song called Forget Him that was on the radio in England oh. at the time. <laughs> yeah. yeah check That's out, a great song, by the way. <laughs> check, out, check out Forget Him, because McCartney only remembered it being a Bobby Rydell song, but if you look at the charts, that's the song they were talking about. And sure enough, it has that same relationship. And that, in fact, that's the, the um, 
I call that the Lydian two. It's just because it it uses that major chord on the second scale degree in a way that would have been done in the Lydian mode uh, that goes back hundreds of years, but not in tonal music. And so that's a chord that um, is used in, oh, eight days a week and, and she's leaving home and many, many other Beatles songs. Uh, another Maybe. example is, you know, the, the, um, the Hard Day's Night chord, which in a song in G major, if you have a D in the bass, it's going to sound like a five chord. And McCartney is playing a D. George Martin is playing Ds on the piano in the low register of the piano. But up above that, you hear an F major chord and a G on top. Pitches that don't have anything to do with the major chord on D that you would expect at the beginning of a chord, of a song in G major. So that Hard Day's Night chord, you know, is brilliant. Uh, but the Beatles find a way to slip that into I don't want to spoil the party and it's there and I'm a loser. You have to listen carefully, but, the, you know, it's in there. And and uh, so other chords like the flat seven chord became really big for them in 1964 and 65. They just uh, the flat seven chord is something that had been used before, but they found about five new uses for it that nobody had else had you know combined it the same way with other harmonies so yeah that's one of the that's one of the really fascinating things about their ears they would find something new that nobody else had done before and they wouldn't <laughs> they wouldn't know what to call it necessarily but their ears would hold on to them and they would the same relationships would come out or would have a new twist the next time they did them when you say no one else had done before, are you even including, say, pre-rock and roll standards, for example? Sure. sure. I mean, hmm. um, folk music and blues, uh, uh, and there's many examples of that flat seven chord I just mentioned. Hmm. And it would have been used, uh, oh, or, or in Bo Diddley and Buddy Holly might have used it, too. Uh, that flat seven chord would have just been a neighbor to the one chord. Your one chord is your home base, your your tonal center, to which all the other chords eventually lead. And if you go from one to a flat seven and back to one, it has a, a bluesy quality. But the Beatles didn't stop there. They would use the flat seven chord to go to four or the flat seven chord to go to five or, you know, something else equally uh, unusual. And those relationships, once the Beatles had done them, they took over. Now, I have to say the flat seven to four is actually something that the four tops used first, but just, you know, weeks before the Beatles did. So <laughs> it's hard to know. It was something in the air, that's for sure. Wow. Tell me something about... I saw her standing there. It starts with a, a seventh chord. Mm -hmm. I think it's the E7. That's was right. Was that commonly done? Because I think, I know Paul has talked about how the bass line in that song was influenced by Chuck Berry's I'm Talking About You. And that's if I'm not mistaken, I'm Talking About You starts with the seventh chord. That's right. Chuck Berry used that, what we call the tonic seven, the one seven chord, quite a bit. Uh, in his uh, guitar playing. So I probably came from Chuck Berry as well, that, that um, seventh chord on the, on the tonic. The, the fun thing about that E7 chord is the Beatles play at all different kinds of places. Sometimes if you watch Lennon uh, in concert playing, I saw her standing there, he's playing that up on the fifth fret with uh, you know what you would call a C7 hand formation up on the fifth fret and it sounds like an e7 chord and he plays at different places just depending on his mood i guess but you you get slightly different voicings of that of that chord all over the guitar the beat you know, especially lennon as a rhythm guitarist he knew that instrument inside out he doesn't get half the credit he deserves as a guitarist well what does it do when you start a song with the seventh chord because most songs start with a major or a minor, right? Yeah, it's uh, it, it it it's really exciting because you're not sure what's going on. Uh, usually, if you hear an extended chord played for uh, several bars, you know, say maybe sixteen beats or so, that would be four bars in that song. You think, oh, that's the tonic chord, but why has it got that 
that seventh in there that's tugging and it, it's totally a blues thing it's r&b but you know the coasters would sing phrases that would end on the lowered seven scale degree which is that seventh in that one seven chord so for instance in young blood george harrison is singing you know these phrases that end on that lowered seven scale degree instead of resolving into the tonic harmony so when he does the same thing years later in I Need You, there's a vocal phrase that ends exactly the same way as Youngblood does. And it relates to that thing you point out, and I saw her standing there. It just it opens the song with something that is exciting because it's tension that's not resolved. Interesting. Can we talk a, a little bit about the Beatles' harmonies? Yeah, sure. And um, how different were their harmonies from the groups that preceded them, like, say, the Beach Boys. Well, certainly they were influenced by the Everleys, as we know. Um, right. And other great harmony groups of the time, like, you know, the Hollies and the Birds and, you know, later Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young. Were they very different in what they did with their harmonies? The amazing thing is how the Beatles, through their career, don't show any progression that you can follow in terms of their vocal harmonies, they, they'd started, like you say, with Everly Brothers very much. Their first two singles, Love Me Do, is like Bye Bye Love Sideways, and Please oh. Please Me adds some of Kathy's Clown in there uh, in terms of the vocal arrangement. And they do a lot of two-part singing through 1963, usually with John singing the lead vocal and McCartney adding what we call a descant vocal above that, often in parallel thirds, but occasionally with fourths and fifths and sometimes not moving in parallel motion. But then they go lots of different directions. They become more Motown influenced in 65 and 66. And so you get things like um, in Help, Lennon is singing the lead, but you hear Paul and George predicting the words he's going to sing, right? They come in and sing before Lennon does, and it's it's just like the vocal arrangement of Please, Mr. Postman. If you listen to the lead singer versus the backing singers there, it's the same relationship that you get in Help. So they, they keep picking up from all sorts of popular music. It's hard to know if the Beach Boys, if there's a specific uh, example from the Beach Boys, but I'll tell you, you know, the vocal parts in Drive My Car are so dissonant that if you took, if you could hear just the vocal parts alone, it probably would remind you of the kind of sound the Beach Boys got from the four freshmen, that the close harmony with real dissonances, uh, dissonance treatment and chromatic uh, relationships. Mm -hmm. And, of course, a lot of uh, Rubber Soul and Revolver are very closely modeled on Detroit and Memphis, uh, Motown and Stax, and the vocals are right in there. But then you get things like Good Day Sunshine and Paperback Writer, where they start to explore the polyphonic relationships. In other words, not singing the same words and the same rhythm, but sort of answering each other or... Um, having one line echo another line. That, very unusual. Um, and it's hard to think of pop forebears for that. I don't know. Can any of you guys oh. think of anything like Paperback Writer, the chorus, or uh, Good Day Sunshine that that came before that? No. They really seem like kind of original experiments uh -huh. to me. All right. I, I always uh, like to point to Yes It Is because I think that song, doesn't it have a lot of dissonance in it? Oh, yes. It's wonderful. It's, you know, Lennon disparaged that song. I think he just called it a like some kind of a retread of this boy. But, <laughs> oh, it's, yeah, it's beautiful uh, vocal harmony. Absolutely. And plays with dissonance. And this boy does as well. I think that's the song that um, William Mann mentioned dare I say it, pandiatonic clusters right. <laughs> was the <laughs> vocal parts of this boy. And it's, it's the same thing going on in Yes, It Is. And yeah, beautiful, uh, beautiful treatment. Yeah. Could you talk a, just a little bit about dissonance for anyone that may not know what it is? 
Sure. It's something the Beatles really learned how to control for themselves in late 1965. So, and it's rampant on the, the um, Rubber Soul album. So there are certain relationships in what we call vertical sonorities. That means tones that are heard at the same time. And the relation, the distance between the tones are measured. The distances are called are measured by what we call intervals. So we can measure an interval as a second or a third or a fourth or a fifth or sixth and so on, mm. as how far apart the the two voices are at any given time. And certain intervals are always consonant when measured against the bass. Certain intervals are always dissonant, and some intervals. It depends on the context. And the Beatles really learned the context. Actually, it goes back to mid-65 with the song Wait. Mm. Uh, the song Wait, if you hear, you know, uh, George plays those two volume control pedal chords mm -hmm. all by themselves just before a verse comes in. Yup, yeah. You know, it's hard to sing just one part because... Yeah. He plays uh, two or three pitches at the same time. But that is what we call a 4-3 suspension. He resolves a dissonant fourth to a consonant third over the same chord. And that same sound affects we can work it out uh, in um, what goes on and uh, in I'm looking through you. They all have that same dissonance. And sometimes they add the sixth resolving to a fifth above that fourth resolving to a third to, to what they didn't know is they were you know they were writing a cadential six four which is something i wish my freshman could learn to do uh, as easy <laughs> as he seemed to i think um yeah. you know if if people are still confused about that if they want to think of a four three suspension and and what it is if you think of the chords that begin pinball wizard Yes. That's a 4-3, yeah. right? Yeah. That's right. That's right. And th there, Pete Townsend is definitely, you know, thinking about uh, Italian opera because the bass line moves down from the, the one chord to the five chord, just like it, it would have in in Renaissance era or early Baroque opera, um, <laughs> where the 4-3 suspension was rampant. Mm -hmm. So you got to give uh, Townsend some credit there. I think he actually... Whether he knew it was a four-three suspension or not, uh, he uh, he he was uh, he had the sound right. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, we're going to bounce around, you know, and uh, so we can all have uh, equal time here. So let me uh, pass you over to Steve. Thank you, Ken. Hello, Walter. Um, your discussion there got me it got me going. Um, you talked about weight as, as having uh, those uh, intricate chords. What would you call the earliest song that shows that they were just not another pop band? Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's... I think, you know, Please Please Me shows me a lot of originality. Uh, there's just so many sparkling things through early 1963 that, you know, totally legitimizes their popularity far and above any other band that had come before. And it's everything, you know, Ringo, uh, although I think George Martin kind of represses Ringo in the studio. If you listen to what Ringo does live on the BBC or in those Hamburg tapes from the end of 62, mm -hmm. uh, he is just rocking out. And it's I think it's all George Martin can do to, you know, tone down the cymbals and the snare. In 1963, and then he, I think, I think he lets Ringo have his way in the studio by late 63. But even in Ringo's work, you can see this incredible energy and a feel for what the song means, and uh, he just develops that beautifully. Even though, you know, McCartney may say, "Oh, we told Ringo everything to play, what part of the symbol to play on, and this and that," it all comes out as. Uh, Ringo's personality uh, just completely and they all grow incredibly uh, like that they were always listening for the new thing you know they they were saying back in early 63 oh wouldn't it be great if there was a guitar that sounded like an organ 
or there was an organ that sounded like a guitar. Mm -hmm. And then so by the end of 63, when uh, I Want to Hold Your Hand came out, Oh, as as recently as maybe 10, 15 years ago, there were still people thinking that was an organ on that track. <laughs> and it was yeah. just, you know, Lennon's guitar plugged into a limiter that was, you know, compressing the hell out of the signal. Uh, so, you know, even in, in 1963, they were looking to change their sound, get new sounds. And, uh, you know, their their lyrics didn't go many new places in 63, except, of course, with exceptions like there's a place you know lennon is exploring you know his his inner soul but you know that was that was not particularly unheard of in in pop music uh you know it's the same kind of thing brian wilson did in in my room which was from about that time maybe a little later Mm -hmm. Um, so you know i wouldn't point to the lyrics in 1963 but in terms of melodic shape their deft use of different scales, both major and minor, and modal scales and chromatic pitches, different harmonies, lots of interesting things going on rhythmically. And with the form of songs, every song had its own relationship between verses and choruses, and the phrases would be of different lengths. And uh, so I guess I would just say, in general, there's lots of things bubbling in 1963 but i don't think it's till 64 that they put aside their success formulas that mm-hmm. really culminate in i want to hold your hand and they say okay you know we're going after america can't buy me love we're going for a new sound it's going to be blues and they consciously drop everything that had made them so popular which is something that happened throughout their career, right? They were constantly reinventing themselves consciously. Oh, yeah. And uh, I think in 64, the first time they decide we're going to, you know, shed our Beatles skin and become something new, I think it's in early 64 that they really show their artists. And then, then of course, they, you know, every song on A Hard Day's Night is their, you know, brand new composition. And they come in and, and uh, record three or four new songs in one February day. It's it's just phenomenal the uh, imagination at work. Mm-hmm. Authors, uh, there's been a you know a, a, a series of books that have argued that either Rubber Soul, Revolver, or Sgt. Pepper were the uh, Beatles' biggest advancement musically. Which one of those albums do you think qualifies for for that? Yeah, well, each in their own way is, and and I would I would say, you know, it depends on what factor you're you're thinking about. But Revolver is definitely a step beyond everything that was going on in rock music, and Pepper was as well. Rubber Soul is, um, you know, a big step from where they had been. You know, I just had a student uh, a couple of days ago tell me, you know, I just heard the song Girl for the first time. And that is a really strange song. <laughs> and I had to agree. You know, it's nothing like anything the Beatles had done before. So in Rubber Soul, there's just so many new things. But I, I think the reason those albums are singled out as great strides from where the Beatles had been is, I mean, certainly each album has its own reasons. But it also was this was the time when the album was coming to the fore in terms of what listeners were buying. You know, they were listening to the hits on the radio. uh, But, I mean, still the top albums in 64 were probably soundtracks and original cast records, right? Mm -hmm. Other, Other than the Beatles. And maybe uh, maybe the Beach Boys had had a, a big album, but albums were not big. I mean, right. most people didn't buy Supreme's albums or Temptations albums. But by late '65, of course, Dylan had made the album really, you know, the thing that the, that the really in tune listener. Uh, the caring listener was uh, going to focus on, and and so Rubber Soul, Revolver, and Sgt. Pepper got swept up in people just suddenly turning their allegiance from hit singles to full-length albums, and I, I think they benefit 
the, the Beatles benefit from that as much as the world benefits from those albums. Mm-hmm. Uh, in terms of a so- of a particular song, if I was to talk to you about a song, it would be "And Your Bird Can Sing." Oh I, yeah, I think that is just one of the most stunning songs they've done. I, I every time I hear that, it, my mouth just drops. I, I I love that song to death. Yeah, what, what would you have to say about that? Oh well, and your bird can sing is great. I I actually hear that as a progression from the word in Rubber Soul, mm-hmm. and that I think Lennon is trying to paint an anti-materialistic sermon, mm-hmm. where the word did, and you know he uh, there are references to Karina Karina, right? Uh, the Dylan uh, version of the old Lead Belly version of an old blues song, Karina Karina, right. which is, uh, you know, I got a bird that whistles, I got a bird that sings, but I don't got Karina, and life don't mean a thing. <laughs> and I think that's where the title comes from, although isn't there a mention of, is it Elvis, or who is it that that song supposedly uh, a reference to? Well, anyway. I, 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 yeah, I, I always thought it was a, a, a woman actually but right yeah. right but i think you know i think it's lennon uh, you can also hear a little bit of messiah complex going there because you know the, the big word in that song is me you tell me you've got everything you want and your bird can sing but you can't get me you can't get and then all the beatles come in screaming me and so me is at the center of it and then at the end of the bridge, Lennon is singing, you know, look in my direction. He's sort of pointing himself out as the leader. And this is all unconscious, I'm sure. But I think the, wh- where he's trying to lead his listeners is to give up the material and pick up on the spiritual or the inner inner life. You know, you got your bird and your bird is green. You know, there are passages from the... Um, what am I trying to think of the uh, Tao Te Ching or what is it that uh, George Harrison studied so much? The ancient Chinese proverbs and poetry. Mm-hmm. There, there, yeah, there's there's one saying in there that actually Sam Phillips made into a song called Five Colors. And it's all about how, you know, the colors of the world distract you from what is real, what is within. And so when, you know, Lennon is singing, you know, you've got all these materialistic things and you could talk about the colors and and everything uh, that you see around you, but you don't really get what's important. And And that would be the word. That would be, you know, Lennon singing me, look in my direction and I'll lead you to where you're going. So anyway, that's my take on on that song but i i love the harmony i love the bridge that chromatic descent under the b minor chord where he's just hammering away the vocal b b b and he changes the chord all over the place Mm -hmm. all kinds of ways that that b is consonant with chords or dissonant with chords he draws everything out of that he can just like just like she loves you yeah 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 is set to three different harmonies or help is set to three different harmonies it's sort of like that with his singing that that pitch B over and over and over in the in the bridge to all the different chords changing underneath. Mm-hmm. And also you can you can compare like Lennon's strumming. Lennon has the most dead strumming on earth in that song. Just you know that E chord over and over, one chord per beat. Whereas the trio of the two casinos and the bass uh, are just you know, flabbergasting in their beauty. Well, it's, uh, you know, Lennon is saying, look, you know, just, you know, get your mind off all that flashy guitar stuff that George and Paul are doing. Just, you know, focus on this, this ohm, this, just this unchanging chord underneath. Um, (laughs) So I don't know, those are the, those are the kinds of things that come to mind when, uh, when I think of that song, which I love dearly. It's, it's, It's great, yeah. And as a musicologist, my last question, as a musicologist, what is your favorite bootleg? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. 
Oh, gosh. There are so many great ones. You know, I still remember the first two I bought, Yellow Matter Custard. Mm -hmm. and Same uh, here. What, and and one that was called Alpha Omega was oh, some of the okay. get back stuff. And I just, you know, I'll never forget the first time I heard that because I knew it was the Beatles, but I'd never heard any of those songs before. And it mm -hmm. was it was so cool. I, you know, when the the Yellow Dog stuff started coming out in the early 90s, was it late 80s? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I just thought that was phenomenal. Uh, <laughs> just incredible. Those those are still some of my favorites. In fact, I played about five of the of the first uh, nine takes of help for my class the other day so they could hear how George couldn't play his big riff in the song during the basic track and he didn't want to do it during the vocals and the, the discussion they had over that was you know great and it's in those bootlegs that you really feel you're you know a fly on the wall in the studio mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Alan back to you Okay, um, you mentioned early uh, that before the Ed Sullivan show, you had had a couple of years of piano lessons. I mean, you're obviously also a guitarist, and there is so much attention in the book to what parts of the drum kit Ringo is using. What what all do you play? Oh, well, you know, I do play a little guitar, but just enough to really to demonstrate to my students and I put a bunch of videos together mm -hmm. uh, that I, I play guitar and bass on those. I don't play drums. Mm -hmm. I've got a son who takes care of that and I love hearing him play. I just love hearing him play. Mm -hmm. I, I, yeah, I've played piano forever and uh, so I, I, I never liked practicing. So <laughs> <laughs> I was a piano major as an undergraduate, but boy, my students today would never believe that. Uh -huh. uh, because, I mean, the, the conservatory level of training that students have today, it just would put my piddly skills to, to shame. But, uh, yeah, I do play a lot of piano, and that's what that's my go-to instrument, really. Hmm. Okay. Uh, when I was in music school, I had a music history teacher named Abraham Vinus. He, he, he wrote a couple of books you might have seen, but um, oh, he, he yeah, used to... Familiar. Yeah. yeah. He used to, when he would demonstrate something, he would go to the piano and it would be a little bit rough and he would turn to the class and say, I don't apologize for my piano playing. I'm a cellist. <laughs> <laughs> That's but, right. <laughs> That's great. Um, uh. Another thing that you mentioned in, in passing was Bo Diddley and mm -hmm. uh, the influence that, that he had. And I, I think another one of the great things about the Beatles is that when they were influenced by something and used it, they would disguise it so incredibly. And the Bo Diddley thing I'm thinking of is the chord progression of Tomorrow Never Knows, which is basically oh, one chord, but they course. go down to the, you know. <laughs> of course. And b believe it or not, Alan, try this. If you take the melody in in the song Bo Diddley, mm -hmm. it's the same melody, the same vocal arpeggiation in Tomorrow Never Knows, mm -hmm. slowed down incredibly. And but you know, isn't isn't that the song uh, about uh, Bo, Diddley, Bo Diddley buy you a diamond ring, and if that diamond ring don't shine, right? Mm -hmm. Isn't that the song? Mm -hmm. Isn't that the one that's called Bo Diddley? Yeah, that's all the same vocal pitches as in Tomorrow Never Knows. And you're right, the, the, the underlying harmony in Tomorrow Never Knows is one to flat seven to one, all over an unchanging first scale degree in the bass. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yet listening to Tomorrow Never Knows, probably the last thing you would think of, <laughs> of is Bo course. Diddley, you know? Miles um, away, yeah. Um, That's amazing. I never thought of that before. <laughs> yeah. um, I thought I'd actually also ask you, it's, it, 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 it's, it, it's, I think, a pretty bizarrely simple answer, but everybody always talks about this as if it's a big mystery. So perhaps you could explain to our readers what an Aeolian cadence is. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, it's not a straightforward thing. There's a couple of different possibilities, but my take on it is... The cadence in P.S. I Love You, really. This is what I call the, the Aeolian cadence, where you have what would sound like 
the six chord to the seven chord to the one chord in the Aeolian mode. The Aeolian mode is the same thing as the natural minor. In other words, it's like that minor scale, except you never have a leading tone. You never raise the seventh scale degree. You always have the lowered seventh scale degree. Mm-hmm. So in in PS I Love You, in the the ending, you, 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 you know, it's one flat seven, flat six, flat seven, one. And I hear, I, I call that the Aeolian cadence because it sounds like the Aeolian mode there. But I think, I think what William Mann was referring to was in, not a was it time. All, all I've got to do, maybe? I, think, I thought it was not no. a second time. Yeah. yeah. Not a second time. Yeah. Not a second time, which ends alternating a one chord with a six chord, a one chord with a six chord, which is alternating a major one chord with a minor six chord and back and forth there, which is, you know, something John Lennon loved Arthur Alexander for. And Lennon loved that progression, one to six, one to six. And I think that's what William Mann is talking about, because that's what you get at the end of the Mahler piece he refers to. Is it uh, Dust Lead von der Erde? Dust Lead von der Erde, right. Yeah. That ends with that, what he calls an Aeolian cadence. And I, I think that's what happens uh, at the end and not a second time. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, will the following volumes of this series take up the solo works, Walter? <laughs> you know, I, I have um, chapters drafted on London and Harrison. Of course, you know, McCartney is, you know, so active uh, and so prolific. I dread the idea of, of, of trying to write that chapter. But um, actually, I'll I, help you. I think, I'll help yeah, you. You know, it might, be, it, it might be necessary, right? I mean, you know, what what a bunch of solo uh, work um, to follow the, the breakup of the Beatles. But uh, Tim Riley and I have been uh, writing a textbook on the Beatles that may be out the end of this year, maybe in time for the White Album celebration. Mm. Hmm. But that's the most recent Beatle project. I see. Oh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What's it called? It's called What Goes On, The Beatles, Their Music, and Their Time, because it, it's aimed for non-musicians, and so we, we're going to cover as much about the culture and you know social things going on uh, as the Beatles were growing up, and how their music and their, their work interacted with the world around them. Mm-hmm. Hmm. I thought that was a good title. Mm-hmm. Maybe not yeah. the most popular song, but it fits. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What was your feeling about Paul's classical stuff? Yeah, you know, Paul's a dabbler. He just, he loves to put his fingers into everything. And, you know, there there's some real cringeworthy moments, I have to say. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but there's some things in the, in the oratorio that are really glorious, I yeah, think. I thought so. Some of it's really, you know, kind of silly, but my gosh, uh, some of it's really beautiful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I, I can't say I've listened to Standing Stone a lot, but I, I suspect there's some good stuff in there, too. Mm-hmm. Like, can I ask uh, Alan what he thinks? Uh, all right. Uh, the, yeah, uh, I, I like the oratorio a lot. I, th- I thought basically mm-hmm. that, you know, we're, we're talking about extended song forms, and if there's one thing the guy can do, it's a song form. Um, yeah. But but I also thought there was a, a, a an extended violin solo in there that made me think that you know this guy could probably write a concerto. Um, That's right. Know, and uh, That's... and he actually has been. I don't know whatever happened to it, but uh, as of 2007, he was working on a guitar concerto, and uh, mm. it never That's saw right. the light of day. Um, he was working with that guitarist uh, Carlos um, Bonell. Um, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. right. Yeah, I never heard much about that project. Yeah, it's a pity. Maybe we will eventually. Uh, mm-hmm. Standing Stone, I wasn't that crazy about. Um, because, I mean, talk about his fear of, of, of plagiarizing existing works. It was sort of like, um, okay, well, now we're going to have a scene with a boat on the water, and suddenly it 
sounds like Debussy, and now we're going to have a battle scene, and it's Shostakovich or Prokofiev. Yes. And so there was a little bit of paint by number in there, I think. Oh, um, yeah. Put. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, but you don't think that, that Paul is familiar with those works, do you? I think he is. No hmm. question. I think he's mentioned, I, I, I think he's I'm, mentioned I'm Debussy sure. before. Yeah. You know, he, he, he would listen voraciously, and, you know, George Martin would talk about how much Strawberry Fields reminds him of Debussy. Mm-hmm. Well, can't you just imagine McCartney wanting to hear what Debussy sounds like? I, 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 I wouldn't be surprised if he knows uh, Shostakovich and Debussy. Yeah, uh, I, I'm, so- I'm sure he does. And you know what? I used to, when I used to spend my evenings at places like Carnegie Hall, um, I got to know some of the ushers, and one of them was saying, hey, Paul McCartney's here the other night, you know, <laughs> you know, and he just went to classical concerts and no, probably nobody bothered him. You right. Know? Uh, and, uh-huh. and as, 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 as you know, I mean, in the, in 66, early 66, when they were not making a new movie, he was off seeing Luciano Berrio and Carl Heinz Stockhausen performances. Hey. So, <laughs> so mm-hmm. I, I think he probably does know a lot about classical music and, and the Debussy because of, I guess, La Mer and stuff like that. If he wants to write a scene about the ocean, he's going to think about that kind of sound, not necessarily say, I'm going to steal some from Debussy, but, you know, that's the sound he associates with classical music doing water, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So... Since you guys brought up classical music, I was actually going to, and I didn't um, ask about Lennon and McCartney as classical composers. Um, and Alan, this would be probably something, you know, that you'd want to comment on, too. I mean, they're, uh, you know, they've always been consider- or compared to classical, you know, the, cla- the great classical compo- co- composers. Walter, how do they fit in as far as you're concerned? Alan, you can go in on that one, too. Yeah, well... You know, I used to hear all the time back when I was starting my career and wanting desperately to do research on the Beatles as a student and was told, no, 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 you can't do that. <laughs> um, and, you know, I was constantly hearing, well, they, they're just not in the same league as Wagner or Mozart or Brahms. But, you know, if you listen to a Schubert song or a Brahms song or a Mozart aria, <laughs> you are getting very close to the Beatles' uh, strengths, uh, and they absolutely are, belong in that same group. I, it's, you know, they never set out to be classical musicians. They didn't set out to write for classical instruments or to study counterpoint and harmony and and the forms of music. They wanted to be, you know, Carol King. They wanted to be Rodgers and Hammerstein and. <laughs> You know, so it, it, there's a charming moment at the end of one of those Ed Sullivan shows. Remember where Ed says, now, boys, you know, he's got the Beatles right there with him. And he says, you know, I want you to know that we just got a telegram from Richard Rogers and he congratulates you. Mm-hmm. And George is looking at John and Paul like, ah, see, that's just what you wanted. And, <laughs> uh, you know, it's just a, it's a wonderful little moment there. Uh, they they wouldn't have gotten a telegram from um, you know Milton Babbitt I'm sure, <laughs> <laughs> but they could have they could have gotten good. one from Leonard Bernstein yeah I mean he right f- from the very beginning was pretty supportive and and yeah. Oh, yeah. towards the end of his life he said that they were the Schuberts of our time so yeah he he did all those young people's concerts with you know doing or he did that young people's concert series program talking about Lennon and McCartney. Um, it's still out there. I, I think you can buy it on DVD now. But, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> right. It's Yeah, he, he was the real champion of the Beatles. A number of classical uh, composers. Ned Warham, a song writer, mm-hmm. uh, spoke about the Beatles a good bit. Yeah. Just the mere fact that there are so many classical arrangements of Beatles songs tells you something, how well the music adapts to that. That's right. Some of those things are wonderful. Too. Some of them are really clever. So Ken and Steve have a couple more questions. Oh yeah, um, I think we're going to have to invite you on another time because there's way when the too new many. book comes out. Uh, oh, oh yeah, for sure. That'd oh, be even, great. Yeah, even before that. <laughs> <laughs> Something I mentioned on this show a while back, I don't remember when, but I thought that it was really unique when the Beatles would take a certain song 
that they had on an album and it would reappear later. Like, for example, uh, You Never Give Me Your Money, which would then be inserted into Carry That Weight. Right. And that's something that I kind of um, associate more with soundtracks to films and, and theater, you know, right. scores and everything. Sure. The idea was of that, a piece, uh, on, in a stage show, sure. Mm-hmm. Right. Is that something that, that was done at all in, with pop groups prior to the Beatles? I don't think so. You know, if anybody did, I would look at the, look for the look at the Moody Blues, but mm. uh, nothing comes to mind. But you know, that was uh, that was uh, although it, it does remind you of like a Broadway show with a reprise of an earlier song coming up at the end. Right. Uh, it, it, it also happens in opera, and I think uh, McCartney said that he was working with George Martin to try to bring some form into the thing, I think were his words for why the you never give me your money would come back the way it does. Um, yeah, it's like a great return, isn't it? Um, yeah, it's, mm-hmm. it's very effective. You know, uh, in, a, in microcosm, something was just pointed out to me the other day that had never occurred to me in Nowhere Man. It's the first verse that comes back at the end. Usually the last verse is a repetition of the third or fourth verse. But in Nowhere Man, it's the first verse that comes back. And the first time you get that verse, it starts a cappella, just the voices, right? Mm -hmm. But in the last hearing of it, it sounds like an arrival that points out that, you know, here is a composer, John Lennon, who knew where he was all the time. But now we got to bring it home to him uh, at the end of the song. Hmm. Hard to put your finger on it, but that's the effect uh, that has for me. And there aren't that many songs that do that, that, that really return to the beginning uh, for their ending in that way. Right. I also wanted to bring up I'll Be Back, because I think that's a very unusual composition. Yeah. In the sense that, that it has so many different sections in it. Exactly. And it still yeah. comes back to the very beginning. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, usually you have a a verse chorus going back to the verse, but there's more to it than that. And it's all done in in two minutes and 20 seconds, you know? Yeah. Isn't that that phenomenal? Yeah, that's a remarkable song. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, Steve was mentioning before, if you could point out a song where, where it was like the first example to you, where they were not just a pop band. You could point to so many examples, but if you go back as early as, say, Ask Me Why. Sure. I think, how unusual a song was that? Because there's there's even a bit of a Latin feel in there, although they were doing Besame Mucho at the same time. But Mm -hmm. um, I thought that was very different in in terms of uh, as a composition. Right. Uh, I'm so glad you point that out because we actually, uh, you know, I'm teaching a Beatles class this semester. And we had a long discussion on the structure of that song that made me go back and rethink it from the start <laughs> that night. And I came back in and, and gave the students a handout on my you know, take on how that song was put together. But yeah, if you think about it in terms of verses, choruses, bridges, refrains, it, it, it's a very unusual construction. And, uh, you know, it, it, in, in a way... It's sort of like some of the uh, songs like uh, like Dreamers do that have unusual things about the form and you just get the sense that they don't quite have control of it yet. And mm. it's a little bit like that in Ask Me Why. It's like it's not under control, but it is so – I mean, it's it's like any composer – if that was the best song they wrote, you should be proud, you know? <laughs> yeah, because we always point to when George Martin would very often say, you know, the first time that he met them, the best song they can come up with was Love Me Do. And, I, and I, you know, <laughs> what was wrong with Ask Me Why? What was wrong with P.S. I Love You? You know, I just, yeah, I just don't get it. But I think they were very unique for its time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you think so. Because, uh, yeah, uh, Ask Me Why definitely outshines uh, Love Be Do uh, as far as I'm concerned. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Steve? When, in ta- well, in talking about songs that were out of control, I mean, and the, the one that comes to my mind is If, if You Got Trouble. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, that, that really, 
you know, in terms of, I, I'm, it's not particularly a favorite of mine in terms mm-hmm. of Lennon and McCartney songs, but there, there's one that I think fits that description perfectly, don't you, Walter? Yeah, it was, you know, it was a song that the Beatles couldn't get a handle on. Mm-hmm. And it was almost like once they heard Ringo sing it, they thought, oh, this doesn't really have potential. Or, you know, because the, the idea without the voice is just this drone, this droning idea that goes on and on. And it could have gone a lot, number of different directions. But, you know, Ringo made a song out of it by singing it. And I think they, you know, they had similar problems around that time. You know, the song That Means a Lot. Right. You know, what That's, a phenomenon. Yeah. What a phenomenal composition, but the Beatles couldn't figure out how to arrange it. What were they going to do with it? And, you know, can you imagine if yesterday had gone the same way because the Beatles couldn't figure out what to do with yesterday? Right. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, they were, it's like their ideas were pushing further than their skills in some ways, you know, that they had to catch up with their ideas and, and sometimes they couldn't always do it. But thankfully George Martin was there to say, Oh, try this. And boy, that, that made the difference a lot. A lot. And, it, and they gave, that means a lot to PJ Proby who actually did a halfway decent job with it. Yeah, I think so. Uh huh. So yeah. Anyway, it could have yeah. been a James Bond song, huh? Yeah. <laughs> could have been. Alan? Okay, so, Will, um, that was a, a fun discussion, and I think, um, you know, substantial in a way that we don't often get to get into. And um, thank you so much for coming, Walter. Yeah, my pleasure. Absolutely. And we should talk to you again when the new book comes out, if not before. Oh, good idea. Um, how do people get um, either in touch with you, or do you, you have a website? Is there something that people can look up? Uh, you know, I'm easy to find through the university, or you could just Google my name. But my email address is, I'm happy to give it out, is w-e-v-e-r-e-t-t at umich, that's U-M-I-C-H, dot E-D-U. Okay, great. And... Uh... Steve, do you want to tell people how to contact you? Uh, BeatlesExaminer at gmail.com is my email address, and I have a Facebook page, Beatles News and Information, where I post all these crazy stories about the Beatles. Uh, you can contact the show at Things We Said Today Radio Show at gmail.com. We have a uh, Facebook page, uh, Things We Said Today Beatles Radio Fans. We have uh, a Twitter address, Things We Said Fab, um, and we're, we're always looking to hear from you with suggestions and comments on the shows. Okay, great. Okay. And Ken? Uh, my email address is everylittlething at att.net. My website is kenmichaelsradio.com. I always say be sure to, to uh, check out the website for Beatles Trivia every week where you can win one out of nine prizes. And I just want to say thank you to all the listeners who have been writing to us lately. And we got a great uh, great response from the Neil Innes interview that we just did. If, uh, if there are any of you that can't get enough of Neil, um, I just did another interview with him, which is now on my website. And we cover a lot of ground that we didn't do on this show, where the Ruddles are concerned, the Beatles, Monty Python, you can find out what two George Harrison videos Neil Innes was in. And uh, the way to find out is by going to my website. And when you see on the tab, More Interviews, go to the drop-down menu to Interviews, page 4, and the entire interview's on there. So find out more about Neil and his career right there on my website at KenMichaelsRadio.com. Okay, so um, you can contact me on Facebook at either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. And for Steve Marinucci, Ken Michaels, and Walter Everett, this is Alan Cozen saying thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. (laughs) 